Hi, everybody. I, I can sort of see you, so I'm going to ask a stupid leading the witness question. How many of you in here have ever had a really tasty cookie? Show of hands. Yeah. Why? Not, not, not why as in how dare you indulge yourself in such earthly delights. Why as in how did that cookie come to be delicious? What, what was the... Everybody has an opinion. What was the magical alchemy that brought that flour and eggs and butter and sugar and stuff and took that lump of chaos and turned it into this? I ask this question because it's my job to figure this kind of stuff out. I'm a culinary scientist. And culinary science is a brand new field that basically takes all the wonderful physics and chemistry and biology from the field of food science and applies it to cooking. And what that boils down to be is I get to work with home cooks, with culinary students, and with some of the best chefs in the world to use understanding of the science of food to make stuff taste really good. This job is terrible. <laughs> it does sound a little idealistic, though, to say we're going to take a bunch of non-scientists we're going to hook them up with some physics and some chemistry, and all of a sudden, we're going to have the best pasta we've ever had. I came into this industry as a cook. And from a cook's perspective, there's a couple things you really, really have to do well in order, for, in order to make this feasible. Number one is you have to be fluent in human speak. You have to be able to talk like a normal human being. You can't just say PhD-level stuff to people who haven't spent eight years of higher education studying science. You have to make this stuff relatable and accessible. The second thing is that there has to be an application. Sooner or later, something has to taste good. So I can know more than anybody on the planet about starch. But if that doesn't help me to make a better donut, I'm personally not that interested. What is super interesting, and the concept that I think has the most potential to come out of this field, is the idea of ingredient functionality which is a lot of syllables for two words, but it means this. We are really good at talking about how much butter is going to be in a cookie. We're good at talking about tablespoons. We're good at talking about the ratios of the different ingredients that might be in that cookie. How much flour to how many parts sugar, how many parts butter, etc. But what we haven't traditionally talked about in cookbooks and in culinary school and on food television and talking to your grandma about her secret sauce, is what does butter mean to a cookie in, in the most meta sense possible? Why, why are their eggs even there? What is their function? What are they doing? And we're going to get to that. But first, I have sort of a really important question to ask you guys. ¿Dónde está el museo? Where is the museum? All right, imagination time. You're in Spain. Yes. You're on vacation in Madrid, and you're intoxicated by the people, and the wine, and the culture, <laughs> and the atmosphere. But you're in a foreign land. You've never been here before, and you don't speak a word of Spanish. And you have to meet a friend at a museum that's somewhere around here in the next couple minutes. So you look in your handy little phrase book, and it says, ¿Dónde está el museo? Where is the museum? You don't know what any of those sounds mean. All you know is that this is a blunt instrument that you can use and hammer people with to get you to the museum. And it does that job admirably. It will get you to the museum. But that's about all it can do if used in that way. But if you take that sentence and you look at what's making it tick, you learn a little bit more about it, you'll find that each of those words is actually playing a functional role in that sentence. So the word donde, where. With that word, if you understand that it unlocks the possibility of asking where anything is, you can ask, where is the museum? You can ask, where is the bathroom? Where are my keys? You can get really philosophical and say, where is the soul? Where is heaven? Where is Waldo? You can, <laughs> you, you can really get into it, and, and this is the idea of functionality. So here's something else. This is an egg. Now, let me make this clear for cooks in the room. We have been doing fantastic things with eggs for a really long time before we started understanding science, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there is another entire world that we can tap into. There's a whole realm of possibilities. If we start to look at it as an egg, 
rather than just a lump like, uh, like that sentence, if we start to take it apart and we see it not as an egg, but as a toolbox, that's when really cool stuff happens. An egg, just like that sentence, is made up of little components. And each of those components, those elements, those are the real ingredients. Those are the movers and shakers in the kitchen that are actually doing stuff in your recipes. That is the answer to what does an egg mean to a cookie. It's the ability to add these components. And not just for cookies. These components, these ingredients, there's a handful of them, they're in all foods. And they're stuff we're already familiar with. Who here has heard of water? It's water, it's proteins, it's sugar, it's fat, it's minerals. There's a few of them, and each of those components has sort of a limited set of tricks that they can play in any recipe. Sugar can only do five things in the kitchen, whether it's in a loaf of brioche, or in some ice cream, or in fried chicken. And so it seems like maybe by getting down to the nitty gritty of food, we're complicating the issue, but really what you're doing is you're simplifying things where instead of having to wrap your brain around the 10,000 different dishes that you might encounter around the world, all you have to do is sort of become fluent in this underlying language of how food does its thing. So when I say that this is universal, and this is how all food works, what I mean is this. This is a brie. This is an extreme quasi-X-rated close-up of brie. <laughs> this brie is full of fat. And that fat that makes that brie ooey-gooey delicious plays by the exact same set of basic rules as the fat in this avocado. Meat is actually chock full of sugar. And that sugar does a lot of the same stuff, actually exactly the same basic stuff, as the sugars that you would find in a blood orange, which looks like that. Kale is mostly water. That water plays by the same set of rules as the water that you would find in a really tasty loaf of bread. Everything is connected. Um, we've, we've established that this is interesting. We've established the framework. You've now got the knowledge. But how do you use that, right? If you can't use this to cook better, we're not interested. So to explain a tangible way we're gonna use this to cook better, let's make the really most obvious analogy of all time and talk about men's suits. So a suit, if you've never worn a suit, if you've never interacted with a suit-wearing person before, you could feasibly think of it as just a unit, another lump, like that sentence, or like the egg, where you put a suit on, period, you take a suit off, period. That's all there is to it. But of course we know that a suit, like almost everything else, is built up of different functional components, and you can nerd out about it to your heart's content. If you tease those components apart, you can start to discover the functionality of why they're there. A belt, for instance, it serves a purpose. And if you're not into belts, you can mimic that purpose with suspenders or a cummerbund or a dead snake that you tie around your waist. <laughs> and once you realize that, you see that there's functionality here. And as long as you're feeling the basic functionality of pants, you're going to be all right. And you can feel free to mix and match all the different colors and textures and styles to your heart's content and really let your creativity flow to create what kind of suit you want. Now with food, the same rationale applies. Once you understand that there is a set of components that are making your cookie work, you can move those components around and you can bring other things into the picture as long as you fill that basic functionality. So with this cookie, say you like cookies that are really, really golden brown or you like cookies that are moist, or sweet, or crumbly, or flaky. You can identify the functional ingredient that's responsible for that awesomeness, and you can enhance it. Now, if you don't want to just enhance something that you like, and you want to do something totally different, uh, who it, all right, how many of you are, or think you are, gluten intolerant? Probably about half of you. Anyway, um, <laughs> there is a way to make a gluten-free cookie that does not suck. There's hope for all of us. <laughs> if you understand what the gluten, which is a protein, if you understand what function that protein's playing, you can put all kinds of other stuff in there that's not going to make you crazy uh, to replicate that function. If you're not gluten intolerant, but you're just lazy, 
and you don't want to go to the store, but you really want cookies, and you maybe no, don't have butter, chances are there is stuff in your pantry right now that can help you replicate that functionality. So it's not just about improving things that we hold near and dear to our hearts already, like a cookie or roast chicken or an omelet. It's about doing stuff sometimes that's so creative that we've never seen it before. This is a dish from a restaurant called Bennu in San Francisco. This is arguably one of the best restaurants in the country. I've been working with them for a couple years on how to make kimchi. Their chef, his name is Corey Lee, is probably one of the best chefs to ever come out of South Korea. He knew how to make kimchi when I met him. That was not the issue. What we've done is we've figured out how kimchi works on a fundamental level so that we can put a totally different spin on it for fine dining. So rather than plopping a pile of kimchi next to perfectly cooked pork belly and oyster, take that kimchi and turn it into a stained glass vase. You pick that vase up with your hands, you put it in your mouth, and it shatters. It's wonderfully crispy. It's like the top of a creme brulee. And that's an experience nobody's ever had before all from knowing how stuff works. Now this is how I want you guys to see an orange. But looking at that is going to freak some people out. There's always going to be those people that whenever you're talking about understanding the science behind any medium that people think is artistic, somebody's always going to say, dude, you're taking the soul out of cooking. You're coming up with a formulaic approach to cooking, which is first of all impossible. There is no A plus B equals delicious. Food is way too complex. We'll never in our lifetimes be able to take the human element out of food and have it be good. What I'm talking about is understanding that complexity so that your creativity can just run wild. Saying that knowing how food works takes the soul out of cooking is just as ridiculous as saying knowing that a song is made up of notes and rhythms and chords is somehow going to take the funk out of music. We've started teaching this way of looking at food at the Culinary Institute of America. Chefs across the country and around the world have started to reach out to understand the science behind their medium so that they can elevate their craft and they can sort of progress our entire food culture onwards. And soon what you're going to see is that these tastemakers, their, their effect is going to trickle down and it's going to infiltrate and sort of embed itself in our food culture. And you're going to see on TV shows and in cookbooks that have nothing to do with science and in talking to your aunt at a dinner party, vestiges of this ingredient functionality and learning about how food works. This is going to be a movement that's going to change the way that we cook and eat in a lot of really heavy ways. But the most exciting way that it's going to change for me is that stuff is going to start tasting even better. Thank you.